Okay, so as I was saying, welcome to another 343 live stream. We're going to be talking about getting started in Ableton today, so nothing super crazy. It should be pretty simple and fun. Um, real quick, I do want to take a little bit of an account of um, where everybody is at. A little bit harder to do on a live stream, but can everyone type a one into chat if they've at least like messed around with Ableton for a little bit or have had it for some time? Um, and then type a two in the chat if you've never opened up Ableton before and you're just here to see what it's about. So if, if we have an idea of <clears throat> what we're looking at already, that should help me move a little bit more quickly. But um, if, if you guys need to, just t type something in chat if you need me to repeat anything or if you want me to um, cover something that maybe I went over it a little bit too quick, just let me know. I know I talk pretty fast. Um, that's a-okay. Um, so um, real quick before I get started as well, can anyone recommend maybe a genre that, that we, we work with today while we're going through Ableton? Pretty much take the first one that Thomas shouts out at me. <laughs> two. All right, that's my favorite genre. We do two step. <laughs> well, okay. If we got a couple of twos, that means that I got to talk about some Ableton stuff. I can't be remiss if I didn't make sure to cover that. All right, cool, cool. That's good. That's good. Okay, I don't even. I'm not even 100% what tribal house means in 2020, so I'm gonna go with future bass because that's a little bit closer to home. Anyway, um, maybe you guys can give me some ideas along the way. Um, so first things first, what what are we looking at here, right? Um, well, this is a uh, essentially it's a it's a virtual studio, right? So um, other DAWs look maybe a little bit more like what you're used to seeing, you know, with the big mixing boards and stuff like that. Um, but Ableton streamlines things in a way that makes um, composition and production really accessible. And that's going to be something that I harp on this entire time is, is speed, right? Because when it comes to creating music, this is, you know, inspiration that we're trying to, you know, chase after. And um, for lack of a better term, it can be fleeting sometimes. You know, if we, if we open up our program, our creative program, and it feels like, um, we're, we're just hitting roadblocks along the way or we're not really sure how to, to realize the ideas that we have in our head, we're going to get frustrated and maybe turn it off or maybe our idea will change and we'll not be as happy with it later. And so speed is of the essence, um, again, for lack of a better term. And so I'll be mentioning along the way a lot of key commands. Um, in chat, definitely ask me to repeat them if you want me to. Um, but I find that using the keyboard as kind of an instrument when it comes to Ableton uh, really helps you just kind of like maneuver through the program a lot easier. And so with that said, if you are familiar with using any other creative softwares all the way down to something like Microsoft Word, um, there's going to be a lot of key commands that translate over to, to Ableton. So, you know, the obvious ones like command or control, depending on if you're on PC or Mac, command or control C for copy, command and control V for paste, command and control D for duplicate. All these things are going to function in a way that should feel natural to you in Ableton. So Definitely be prepared to interface with that. Um, get used to maybe using the arrow keys to maneuver through some of the interfaces because uh, it can be a lot more comfortable than using the mouse and keyboard for everything, especially when it comes to uh, writing notes, right? Notating out melodies and harmonies. So with that said, um, let's jump into the interface a little bit. Um, if you want, guys, everyone in YouTube land, I can zoom my interface in. Um, as you guys can as well by going into your settings. A quick command for that would be command or control comma to bring that up very quickly. If we go to, let's see, is it in look and feel, we have this zoom display feature, which is not like me zooming in like this. However, it will actually increase the size of all these Ableton windows. And so if anyone's having a hard time reading what's going on on the screen, let me know. I can increase the size. I think for now, maybe something like, I don't know, 115 should be, whoa, 115 should be good for us, right? Um, but let me know with that said. So you can see that Ableton is split up into um, a few different panels. And there is one button in particular that we're going to be using a lot to kind of jump back and forth between a couple of uh, views. And that's going to be the tab button. So if everyone who has got Ableton open hits that tab button, you're going to see it changes this middle window to something a little bit different, right? So instead of columns, we've got rows. And so if you see, we have 
this kind of seafoam green MIDI, this other seafoam green MIDI, and then the two blue audio tracks. Do you see how they turn themselves on their side over here on the right? So we're still looking at essentially the same thing, but one view is more geared towards live performance, which is the one that we have open here now, and one view is more geared towards um, production and arrangement, um, which is the one we're on here now. So I'll be talking about the difference between those two a little bit later. Um, but right now, I would like us to focus on what's going on on the left side of the screen here. Um, this is Ableton's kind of toolbox, for lack of a better term. So if any of us have used Photoshop or anything like that, this is very sim akin to like the list of different tools that we have access to when it comes to um, composing and producing and mixing and engineering in Ableton. Um, on the left, we have collections. I will come back to, to how this works, and you'll see that I don't really interface with this much, but I will explain this. And for those of you who are really um, organized and OCD, this is going to be um, a lifesaver for you. Um, or people like me who have a large list of sample folders, I really should probably go through here and uh, interface with the collections here because it would help me organize my, my sounds and stuff. But I remiss, I'll come back to that. Um, there are a few different tabs here that are going to make getting started with Ableton a lot easier for us. And um, the one that I'm going to mention most is instruments and audio effects. So we do have sounds and drums, which are going to be pre-made kits and instruments that you can uh, use in your productions. And so I do also recommend exploring through there if you're just getting started to see what they have access to. Um, you'll, you'll find stuff that you really like to use or that helps you compose um, and, and you know get, become familiar with where it is and how to use it. But with that said, we can actually access most all of that, if not all of that, through the instruments and the audio tab as well. We just actually tell it to be a little bit more specific about what tool we're looking for um, those sounds or what we call presets or pre-designed effects or sounds um, in Ableton. And so I'll be mostly talking about instruments and audio effects. We also have MIDI effects, which is um, something that very specifically will interact with this piano grid that we'll be dealing with to write um, melody and harmony, which we'll get back to in a bit. And Max for Live, not what this is about, so we'll skip over that. And plugins is going to be any third-party software that you may have downloaded onto your computer. And so, again, I'm not really going to get into that. That's that's up to you guys to. Got a question? Yeah. What's up? Let's do it. Let's see. I'm I'm gonna pick something, but if you need it to be any more, just let me know. Let's see, 125? No, 140. There we go. Let's get real zoomed in there. That'll be fine. Um, so thank you. And so, like with I said, or as I said, plugins are going to be where you find any other third-party software, um, not necessarily stuff that Ableton, the company themselves, made, but maybe other companies who you're using instruments or audio effects from. And then below that, we actually have where Ableton interfaces with the files and folders on your computer itself. And so the PAX folder is Ableton stuff, the stuff that comes when you download and install Ableton. Depending on what version of Ableton you have, this may look a little bit different for you, um, but for the most part, everything should still be here. If we go into PAX, we get a giant list of um, instruments and percussion and um, sounds that uh, Ableton has organized into various different genres, but the core library is going to be the one that everyone should have. So if we go to core library and then we go to drums or samples or sounds, this is going to be a really solid place to find uh, source content to start with. Um, if we don't have our own you know, samples that we've downloaded from the internet, be it from Reddit or Splice uh, is a really popular library for samples to use in your own production. Um, and with that said, if you do have your own sort of samples or use Splice, we can actually add a folder from our desktop or wherever it is else on your computer to Ableton so that when we click on the folder itself, we can interface with it just like any other Ableton folder. And that makes it very easy to use your own content um, moving forward in Ableton. So you'll see me probably clicking down to the samples folder maybe once or twice, probably for drum sounds. Uh, what you decide to sample and create yourself is you know, ultimately up to you. I do like to use drum sounds because I work with a lot of different genres depending on um, if it's for me or if it's for a client or something else entirely. Um, so it's nice to have a lot of that on hand. Um, but if you may choose to create everything from scratch yourself, that's great. Maybe you won't even use the sample pack folder. Um, moving over from Ableton's interface to this middle screen again, we can see that the, the default loadup of Ableton has a few different things already given to you um, on the interface. And that's gonna be two MIDI tracks, which we can see here, and two audio tracks, which we can see here. Um, these are gonna be the two main tracks that we interface with um, in Ableton to, to create music. 
MIDI tracks are used for plotting notes on a grid, right? So when we double click on one of these boxes to create a MIDI track, it gives us one single measure of a MIDI track. And you can see we have this piano turned on its side here. If we hover over one of these windows, our mouse will turn into a magnifying glass so we can see more or less of the piano and more or less of the rhythmic region or the time grid. And this is how we create melodies, harmonies, use virtual instruments, stuff like this. And then we have the audio tab or audio track, which is, you know, as it mentions, for recording audio. Like if this microphone here were to be plugged into the device talking to my computer right now, I could record my voice into Ableton. Um, but we would need to go and make sure that Ableton is receiving audio input from something, right? Otherwise, this is not going to record anything. And the way that we do that is by going into the settings again. So if anyone remembers, that's command or control comma. And then in the audio tab, which should be where it, what it pulls up naturally, we see audio input device, which I have nothing selected here. So we're not going to really be able to record audio from an external source. And then output device, which is going to be for your headphones or for your speakers. Um, if you have neither of these, it will be set to your built-in, which I think is called built-in for Macs and then maybe something different for PC computers. Um, and I will be returning to this settings panel and explaining a couple of different things further in a little bit. But if I were to have selected an input, I can tell this track to record my audio. Um, and there are a couple of other things in Ableton that I need to ensure first that it, it will be doing that. Um, again, I'll get to that in a little bit. Over here, we can see two tracks kind of stuck to the master channel, which I'll explain in a second. Uh, this is going to be reverb and delay. These are what we call sends and returns. Um, they're a little bit more complicated, but just a, a quick explanation of what these are is they're a special track that we can't put any instrument onto or any audio directly onto, only audio effects or processing um, effects, right? And then we can send a track from Ableton into that send or return track, and it will be processed by whatever we have on here. So Ableton defaults a reverb effect and a delay effect. We may choose to change this later, but this is a way that we can add um, audio effects like delay and reverb to a track without putting it directly on the track itself. And that's through these little knobs down here. But I digress. We may, we may or may not get into that later. In fact, we can just delete these if we want to. And then over here, we have the master channel, which for, for those of you who are familiar with that term, that's the comp the, everything summed together. All of our audio, regardless of what's, what track it's coming from, is going to be running out of our master channel. And so this is where we're going to be doing like our, our mastering, any sort of engineering, which we may or may not have time to talk a little bit about. Um, and so these are the, the main tracks and, and interfaces that we're going to be dealing with for our workspace in Ableton. And so if we go over to the Instruments tab over here, we can see what that looks like. And so um, in Instruments, these are going to be things that we use to either um, bring our samples into Ableton, if you don't want to be using audio tracks for that, or to design sounds um, with various different styles of sound design that Ableton provides for us. Or um, we can also use this to create like multiple instruments at once to then do some like live performance style stuff with, 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 which I will probably not talk about anyway. And so the first one I do want to bring up is drum rack. And now anything in this instruments tab is going to go onto a MIDI track because it's a MIDI instrument, right? So what we can do is either highlight a MIDI track and double click on drum rack, or we can just drag and drop it right onto the one we have. Or if we want, we can drag and drop it into the empty space over here and it will add a new MIDI track for us because it's smart, it knows what you need, and add a drum rack right on top of that. So with that done now, I'm actually just going to delete all of these empty tracks because we don't really need them. And we're going to be building up our workspace first because there's a little handy trick that Ableton provides for you to make getting started a lot easier. Um, if you guys aren't, I do recommend, if it's possible, to follow along in Ableton um, a little bit with what I'm doing right now uh, because you may want to set up Ableton in a similar way. Um, otherwise, it's up to you to just listen. So this drum rack device, if anyone's familiar with the old school drum pads that have like the little squares on it, and you can hit them to trigger a drum sound, is going to function very similarly. So if we look down at this device here, we have um, pads with note names on them. Uh, if you're not familiar with the note names, don't worry about it. It's something I do recommend becoming a little bit more familiar with at least, but it's not crucial, especially at the beginning. But what these note names represent and why they have individual numbers after them 
is because they do all correspond to one of these notes on the keyboard. So if I zoom out and scroll up and down, there are 128 of these things, and they all have an individual note name and number to represent what note these pads are attached to. And so instead of playing different notes with an instrument, what each one of these pads will do is trigger a sample, whether it be from Ableton's core library samples folder or one you have yourself. And so um, let's bring some samples in. And so I'll try and grab one from the Ableton core library. Um, I don't use these much, so I'm not really sure what I'm gonna find, but I do recommend going through here. Let's find a kick drum, see if they've got anything great. Honestly, these are all fine, to be fair. So let's grab something simple. I'll grab both of these. Seems good. Some 90s kicks. We're going for future bass anyway, right? And then, let's see, we got, we got some hi-hats. And you see how I dragged the sample directly onto the pad? Um, something that people fall into at the beginning when they're using this device is they'll drag the sample up here, and then you'll see it replaces your entire drum rack with the sample itself in another one of Ableton's tools. So we wanna make sure we don't do that. We wanna make sure that we're dragging the samples that we're choosing from here directly onto the pad we want them on. And then we can play them like this by clicking the little play button. So I'm just gonna grab a couple of drum sounds that we know we're probably going to want. Um, just, just so that I have them here in this device, that's gonna be a kick drum, a hi-hat, a snare, anything beyond that entirely up to you, especially dependent on the genre that you're creating. Um, but for a little future bass example, I think these will be fine. Oh my. Also, how's the audio for everybody? Anyone feel like they need uh, the audio to go up or down with anything? Let us know. And here, we'll grab, we'll grab a couple of miscellaneous percussion. Why not? Let's do it. And we also need a snare. So I want something for the intro and I also want something for the main section of the song, right? When we're choosing our samples, um, we can, you know, we don't have to spend, you know, all day painstakingly picking the perfect ones because we can very easily just drag a new sample onto a pad even when we have stuff written out later on and it will swap that sound out in our song. So we can use this to start and then change things later if we want to. So we don't have to, you know, pull our hair out over selecting our starting samples, but I do want to keep in mind what kind of samples I want. And the reason why I'm grabbing like more than one kick drum and more than one snare drum is because we might want our drums to be different throughout the song, right? Maybe the intro drums are not going to be as heavy and impactful as the drop drums or the chorus drums, for instance. And so it's, it's important to keep in mind there are just different parts of the song. We might want different styles of drums for them. So uh, maybe just grab a couple of different kinds. All right, so let's see, we have two kicks, two hats, one snare, a couple of rides, and some percussion. Let's see, I need a bigger snare. These are, well, I'll use that. That'll be fine for what we're doing. And so now that we have all of our drums consolidated into this little box here, if I go back into this MIDI clip, which remember I, I added by just double clicking on one of these lines here, we can now see and only see every individual drum kit attached to a note now. Um, notice how Ableton gets rid of the notes that do not have samples attached to them. That's just for our convenience. We can bring them back by clicking on this fold button a couple of times. Oh, apparently we cannot, excuse me. Um, in If we were not using drum rack, we would be able to like that. But yeah, they remove the notes not being used for your convenience so that we can only see the ones that we're going to be plotting rhythms out on. If we turn this little headphone symbol on, which is very important and very small, kind of hidden up here above the keys, we'll actually be able to hear the individual sample when either we click on the key associated with it, place a note, highlight a note, or change a note on a line. Um, that's just pretty handy for when you're doing your, your drum beats. And so I do recommend having this on, especially if you're doing melodies and stuff. If you want to work on a melody or a beat while the track is playing in the background, maybe having this off might help not get just the audio clustered on top of itself. Um, so just do be aware of this. Whenever you see this off, it means that you're not going to be able to hear what's going on on your MIDI track. Um, so for sake of time, I don't want to get too much into music theory because that would be an entire stream on its own. And so, um, you know, if, for those of you who are not familiar with 
any music theory at all, feel free to ask any questions regarding that, and I'll be happy to um, explain them. But I'm going to be using some music theory terms here to talk my way through this beat that I'm going to lay out. Um, again, just stop me if you want me to explain anything. But right now, we're only looking at one measure because I just double-clicked a default MIDI track in down here. And so I do, in fact, want to extend the amount of space that I'm looking at so I have more room to make varieties or, or make, make, make variations in my drum beat. So there are a couple of different ways that I can do this, but the way that I like to do this and I find one of the more easy ways is to go down to the bottom left here where we have some settings for a MIDI clip. And, oh, excuse me. This thing takes a little get used to. And if we ignore everything else going on here except for this length down here, we're looking at measures on this far left panel. So if I change this one to a four, now we have a phrase of four measures, which is a lot more musically coherent for creating something like a drum beat, especially when you're writing like EDM style music. For the most part, it's all in four, four. Um, if you don't know what I mean, don't worry about it. <clears throat> and so I want kind of two different beats here, right? I want maybe an intro drum and I want a, a main section drum. And so I'm going to plot something out that's very basic. Um, the way that I work is very much, um, I like to hear things and then I can hear changes that might need to be made. And so, especially if I don't necessarily have an idea, I'll just write something very basic and just be purely because of the samples I've chosen, I might be able to hear some, some changes that I can make to a basic drum beat to make it more interesting. So with that said, um, let's just plot in something very like kind of mathematical, um, for example, and I'll use my intro drum. So the one that's a little bit less intense, grab a hi-hat ride there and what I'm doing here is double clicking to place a note I'm then highlighting that note and hitting command C or control C to copy and command C or control V to paste and then my arrow keys to move the MIDI note up and down on the thing I'm not really using my mouse and keyboard to place these notes you'll also notice that they have different colors this is because what I've done is hovered my mouse over the MIDI note itself and while holding command or control, depending on if you're on PC or Mac, I can change the symbol to this kind of up down arrow crossing a line. And that allows me to actually change the velocity of this individual sample. In this instance, the velocity is going to change the volume of the sample. And so I'm able to kind of mix these drums to each other as I go uh, with these velocity sliders. So this is much easier than grabbing the flag down here especially if you have multiple notes overlapping each other. Because for instance, if I layer all of these things together, there's a lot of individual flags on top of each other here, but I can only see one. So I find hovering over the note you want to adjust and then clicking and dragging up or down to adjust it is definitely the way to go there. So let's move on with what we're doing here. Get our snare. And again, I said I was going to do something very basic. And so we're looking at maybe, you know, just just half a measure of eighth note hi-hats and alternating kick and snare on the quarter note. And then I'll put a right at the very beginning only for spice. Ooh. Um, so now that I have this, ooh, excuse me, and this is going to be my basic drum loop, all I have to do is highlight all of this. And when I highlight in a MIDI region, a MIDI window, I need to make sure I'm including negative space because there are things in music called rests. And so negative space actually means something in music, right? Like we pause for a moment. And so if you don't highlight negative space, if you see the region, this little blue region up here, it leaves this last 16th note out. And so I very much want to highlight, even though there's nothing here, I want to start highlighting from over here so that I highlight a rhythmically even region so that when I hit command D or control D to duplicate, it duplicates it in time. You see, if I don't do this, it's going to duplicate over the note and now I'm going to be all out of time and this is going to sound crazy. So we got to make sure that we're highlighting the negative space as well. So now that I have this basic beat, let's just play it. And as I play it, my ears will start to kind of pick up on different rhythms that I can use here to make this more interesting, right? We can play this track by either pressing the play button here or the play button over here along this row. Oops, I forgot to delete these rides. Get these out of here. Let's 
it's also a good way to just make sure that the samples you chose sound pretty good together. Um, to be fair, I don't even mind this, but let's just make it a little bit more interesting. And I find an easy way to do that while holding a pretty consistent beat, especially since, you know, this is EDM, D stands for dance, trying to get people to dance. Um, we're going to be wanting to adjust these major impact drums and maybe adding a little bit more um, what we call grace notes or ghost notes, uh, which are ones that are not meant to have a main rhythmic hit, but meant to kind of just fill space and create more groove. So I'll just start moving these kick drums around, maybe adding more. You might also notice I'm going to adjust the velocity of some of these drums. When you see me adjust the velocity of a kick or a snare, it's because I want it to be more of one of those ghost notes so that it doesn't really feel like a main part of the rhythm. Uh, an example of that would be like putting a snare here and then turning down the velocity so that it's just a rhythmic addition. Now if I play this, do we notice how it doesn't really hit like the main snare does, but that's important. That's important to have that rhythm kind of carry into uh, the next part of it. And so really I'm just going to do this without paying much attention to be fair. We're just going to add some rhythmic variation to this and again I can always go back in and change this so as I add more to the song my ears and my brain will start to pick out areas where I need to make adjustments um, and it will be much easier to hear later so again you don't need to make something perfect right from the beginning we can always go back in and change stuff so maybe just have no kick there get a double one at the beginning there two snares we'll make that one heavy too um, something to note uh, that is kind of just a little songwriting thing Whenever you have a phrase like this and you want it to repeat into itself, be wary about the way that it ends and the way that it starts because that's going to be important to have a smooth transition. Um, what happens in the middle can be kind of funky and crazy, right? But if it feels like it's either a loop, like there's there's some um, like juxtaposition between this half of the last measure and this half of the first measure, it's not going to flow right. So let's just make sure that these lead into each other pretty well. Cool. So right away, my ears heard maybe another double kick drum right there. Um, it, it feels like it would flow a little bit better with that. Um, I think over time, you guys will get more and more comfortable with stylistically what pleases you. And so doing something like this will become just faster and faster and faster. Um, while I'm here, there's a couple of other tricks that I want to use, particularly with my hi-hats. I want to just come in and randomly drag, not too randomly, uh, the velocities of these hi-hats up and down just a little bit, just nudging them up and down, which will give them a little bit more of a realistic feel because when a drummer plays hi-hats, they're not going to hit the same velocity on those hi-hats every time, right? So we want this to feel a little bit more natural by adjusting these velocities real quick, and I'm not really paying attention to what I'm doing. And then what we're going to do is highlight everything on the hi-hat line by clicking the keyboard note associated with it, like that. And then while holding control, I'm going to tap my right arrow key a few times. The reason for holding control is because if I don't, it's going to snap it to the grid. It's going to move it by a line. What I want it to do is detach itself from the grid and just nudge itself over by a fraction of an amount so that I can just barely push it off of the line. Um, this is again going to help it feel a lot more natural and when you have samples overlap each other like this like I have a hi-hat a ride and a kick might not make sense maybe I'd get rid of this hi-hat but when you have this separating them in time by a fraction of amount will really help the listener's brain hear those samples individually and not kind of combine it all into one just goopy sound right so it helps us separate these things out from the mix and so now that we have this I'll play it through just to make sure we're happy with it and then we can move on to the next section of this great so I'm cool with this maybe I'll add another hi-hat there now that I heard that and and we can move on you got a question Yeah, so actually that, that's, that's a perfect note to make because when I was in class, 
Um, I think one of the biggest notes I have about that experience is meeting people who write music I don't necessarily listen to or write. Um, and it would get me involved in their process, which would teach me a lot more about how just music is made in general. It would teach me things about the music that I'm making for myself in a way I didn't expect. Um, but it also gave me the inspiration to try and create those things that I didn't necessarily listen to or know much about, which did kind of open my mind on the production front quite a bit as far as what I have at my disposal, what I have access to. Um, but it's also a really cool just kind of thought experiment because when you're writing something for yourself, it can be a little bit um, overwhelming, the concept of like, oh, I really want to make something that I like, right? Um, it can get in the way of making a production sometimes. And so I find that if you maybe step aside from that a little bit and run an experiment where maybe like, maybe you really don't like dubstep or not necessarily don't like it, but maybe you just don't listen to it at all. Uh, take a day to write a dubstep song, you know? Um, put, put your mind out of its comfort, put your creativity out of its comfort zone. And I think um, it really helped me open doors as far as um, getting ideas for how to finish songs. Um, it, it, it definitely taught me a lot, a lot about arrangement and transitioning. Um, it helped expand my sample library. It also helped just expand my understanding of music in general. Um, so I'm not sure if that fully answered your question. Um, but yeah, I would, I would definitely recommend um, not being so hard on maybe every time you open up Ableton that you need to finish a song and it needs to be great, right? Um, like this is definitely a process and it requires a lot of experimenting. I mean, like the reason why I'm here live streaming at all is because I racked up my 10,000 hours a long time ago and probably doubled it since then. So I've just spent a whole bunch of time in here. And if you check my Spotify, which is Icarus Moth on Spotify, there's like seven songs, right? So for my 20,000 hours, I've put out, you know, how much music? Um, with that said, I have thousands of pieces of music that are not finished or I don't like, or not necessarily I don't like, but I don't think are, you know, releasable. Um, and that's okay. You know, that's not something to be, you know, hard on myself about because the entire time I was learning and uh, developing my own style and getting closer to, um, being able to create exactly what I want to at any given time. Um, feel free to ask me to elaborate on anything <laughs> specific about that if you want. Um. So yeah, co coming back into this future based song, now that we have an actual piece of content here that we've created ourselves, I actually want to move this into our other view that we talked about before, right? This is the uh, the arrangement view, view that I was talking about. Right now, we're in what's called session view. So that's, that's this right here with the drum rack on the column. So there are a couple of ways of moving this into arrangement view. We can copy it from here by highlighting it and hitting command or control C and then moving over here and then pasting it in the track by hitting command or control V. You can see it goes there. Or we can click and drag and while we're still holding click and dragging it around, we can hit tab and we'll still have access to it here to then drop on the track. Or we could hit this record button and then play the track and it would record into arrangement view here. Uh, highly don't recommend using that method. <laughs> it's very slow. So let's just copy this in and paste it here. You'll notice, however, though, that it's kind of grayed out, right? And actually, if I delete this and then play it, we're hearing drums, even though there's no drums here, right? That's because it's actually still pulling audio from our session view. We need to tell Ableton to switch where it's playing audio from. Ableton will always automatically switch back to session view if you play anything from session view. So since I played this drum track from here, it thinks, oh, we want to have audio coming from session view. There's two places in Ableton we can tell it to switch. It's going to be this little orange button in the bottom right here. It's got the play with the like three lines above it. Or in arrangement view, it's going to be located up here in the corner um, under your measure like ruler. And so if we click this, you'll notice it fills in the color on our tracks. And now if I hit spacebar here, it plays nothing because there is in fact nothing here, which is exactly what we wanted, right? Now that we're in arrangement view, as it states, we can start arranging our song. And so there's a couple of different ways that a MIDI clip is going to interact with this grid. And so the first thing I want you to note is that when I hover near the edge of it, I get these brackets. My, my mouse turns into a bracket. I can then click and drag this out. This is because loop has been enabled down here on the MIDI track itself. If this was disabled, it would not allow me to do that. However, what this means though, if we can see this little broken line where the loop marker happened, 
if I drag this out to make three of them, and then I come in here and I make a change to some of the notes in here, say just delete a whole bunch of them, you notice how it deletes it out of all three? That's because we've looped the same region of MIDI. And so that's identified to us by this kind of broken line here every time it, it, it plays back, right? If we wanted these things to act as unique MIDI clips, there's a few different things we can do. We can click our flag at the end point of this MIDI clip and hit Command or Control E for slice or cut. And then you'll see now this line is hard. Like it's, it's and I can select these two things individually, right? It's no longer an open line. And so now if I make an adjustment here, it's just unique to this track. Whereas these two are still connected via loop. So if I make an adjustment in here, it will change in both of them. We can also just copy a section by highlighting only the section we want from here and pasting it anywhere else on the track. So that's another way of separating these things. It's important to keep in mind when you might want to have something separated and when you might want to have a loop, right? Uh, making variation is a really good example of having something separated. So if I loop this out and say, oh, I want there to be a variation in the drums right here. What I can do is highlight the area and hit my slice button, right? Command E and then go into here and you'll see now that I can still see all the original MIDI if I were to drag this back. However, it's grayed out, right? Because it's, oops, it's not actually being played because that's part of this track, right? Which now should have some grayed out MIDI to the right, but it won't let me, it won't expand it to let me see it. So what I can do now here is make the variation that I want to, like maybe just add a whole bunch of hi-hats. <laughs> and what I need to now do to kind of like re-include this into the original clip is highlight everything together and right click on it and either hit consolidate or just hit command or control J, which is the quick command for consolidating these things. So what I did is I made a loop, I brought it in, I duplicated it, I made a variation at the end of the other one, and then I consolidated everything together, which essentially turned my four measure drum loop into an eight measure drum loop that now has a little bit of variation into it and I'm good to kind of use now as its own chunk. Um, personally, I don't loop stuff very much. I just find that duplicating it works very well. And then if you do need to make an adjustment that you want to translate into all of them, we can always just do the adjustment and then duplicate them again back on top of each other. So that's usually how I work. However, using the loop feature may make your lives a lot easier depending on how you like to use Ableton. So now that we have this drum beat in the drum rack, um, let's go to another MIDI track. So right now I could right click in the space here and hit insert MIDI track, or I could go back into instruments and you know select one of these things here. Um, I want to mention how to search for Ableton's presets. Um, we'll, we'll maybe have time to design one of our own sounds if we can. Um, but first, I just want to show you how you might want to grab some starting sounds. Again, we can go to sounds if we want to. And we see we have uh, some different categories of sounds. But each one of these synths or sounds is going to be coming from one of these devices. And you can't really tell ahead of time which device it's coming from which is why I like to pull presets from the instruments tab specifically, because I can say, hey, I only want presets from operator, or hey, I only want presets from sampler. Each one of these devices is geared towards something different. For example, analog, it's a very basic synthesizer. And so you should expect the sounds of presets from analog to be kind of basic synth sounds, right? Whereas sampler is a sampler. It's based on real recording sounds. And so you should probably expect to find more acoustic if you're searching for an acoustic instrument, sampler is probably the better place to look, right? Because they'll actually sample acoustic sounds. I would probably not look for something like that in analog because it's a basic synth. In sounds, it's just going to show you all of them. The analog one, the sampler one, the operator one. And so let's, let's look for this stuff in instruments instead. So what I can do is go up to search and type in piano. It's going to remove any of the options here that do not have a piano sound in it. So we see the analog's got one, collision, electric, instrument rack has one, operator, sampler, simpler, etc. Again, sampler is great if you're looking for an actual acoustic sound because they might have a real recorded acoustic instrument. Instrument rack is going to be another good one because that's going to be a more complex sound that they've designed because it is going to involve multiple instruments. Um, operator is really great for more complex synth sounds and then analog is really wonderful for more basic synth sounds. Um, tension is kind of like their guitar-esque or string sound emulator. Uh, we have Wavetable, which is the new one, kind of similar to Serum, if anyone's uh, familiar with that. It's, it's very popular in the production world these days. Collision is going to be kind of like 
mallets and bells and drums a little bit and then electric is actually their electric piano model which is not bad we could we could start with that and since this is an elect or a future based song let's actually use something from here you'll notice we can still hear what these are before we use it so i can get a good idea of what i'm i'm looking at before i drag it in which makes it very simple to choose something that you like oh we're taking a break I don't know what the full deal is though. So because of um, obviously everything going on right now, we're, we all have a lot of time to spend in our homes on our computers. Um, and you know we're trying to help you all not go stir crazy with cabin fever. So we're offering discounts on our online classes. Um, some of which I'm definitely going to be teaching for sure. So if you like me, I'll be there. Uh, I'm not 100% sure what the, the discount is right now. Um, Ah. so it's it's flexible apparently so definitely reach out to us if you're interested but um, budget is a worry to you um, we're, we're here to chat about stuff like that for sure okay so um, Thomas what's your YouTube name right now uh, in that is it just admin or whatever okay so the 343 labs account is going to post a link to that in the chat for you guys if you're interested in that um, like I said, we have a lot of time here, so let's let's spend it together <laughs> if we can, doing some music stuff for sure, right? Um, cool. I mean, we were just we were streaming that whole time, right? Okay, so I've got this e piano here, right? Um, I can play this piano from my keyboard. There's just one thing I need to make sure that I do first, which is turn on this kind of tiny little keyboard symbol at the top right hand corner of Ableton, and what that's going to do is it's going to give me an octave on my keyboard starting on A. So A is C, and then from that point on, it's kind of meant to emulate what a real piano looks like. So we have A, W, S, E, D, and then R is nothing because there's no black key in between E and F, right? So we have F, T, G, Y, H, U, and J, um, and then K. So it does go a little bit higher than an octave, but um, with that said, we'll, we'll, we'll be fine with that. Z and X is your octave shift for up and down. And then C and V is your velocity up and down. So again, velocity means something different depending on what instrument or sample you're using, but it's generally defaulted to volume. So right now C and V is going to raise and lower the volume of this sound as I play it. And so we can hear this, I can play chords on my keyboard. And so if you really hate looking at this sideways piano, which I really know, some people are not very comfortable with the piano and music theory and clicking in these little squares and repositioning them like this is the part of Ableton that kind of makes you not want to do it right like I, I definitely find that this is the most popular least favorite part for people when it comes to Ableton uh, we don't need necessarily to interface with that area so much there's a lot of different things that Ableton will provide for us to make our lives easier um, I'm going to show you a couple one definitely is uh, the recording of um, this synth sound with the computer keyboard being like a like a piano because it's pretty easy for example like a d and g makes a c major and then s f and h it's a d minor so it's pretty easy for us to play chord progressions in like that and then go in and make adjustments or even just to create the chord shapes so that's kind of what i'm going to do here um, i'm going to play in something that's kind of cool and also kind of not quite right and then i'm going to go into the midi and then fix it um, there's one thing that we need to make sure of before we actually record this and you'd notice this because you would not be able to play the sound with your keyboard anyway which is to actually arm the track so without this on we can't play it and we can't record it so we need to make sure that that's on and then when I hit this record button over top our drums we're going to be able to play in keys on the keyboard um, one thing that is going to help uh, especially you guys who are going to be recording vocals yourself out a lot which if we go back into the Ableton settings one more time with command or control comma and we go to record warp and launch at the very top here we have this count in it's the third one down I have mine set to one bar what that means is when you hit the record button you're gonna hear a metronome go just once for one one count of four which is one bar right before the recording starts so for example, if you're recording yourself singing, it can be really handy to have that lead in 
especially if you're singing ahead of time, right? Um, so you don't have to start right when the beat starts and, and be afraid of having some of your voice get cut, right? So let's go ahead and answer a question. What's up? Yeah, no, no, I'll go right back into that. So, so yeah, I, would, I do recommend having the count-in set to one bar just to make recording a little more comfortable. Uh, we had a question about um, some of these rhythmic divisions and then something called quantization. Um, so I will actually take the time to, to explain that right now. Um, when we're looking at the grid like this, we can see numbers along the top, right? We got 1, 1 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, and then 2. These represent, represent our quarter notes and our measures, right? So 1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, that is each the length of a quarter note. So if I put a MIDI note in here, this is one quarter note in length. So how fractions work, right? We can half that for an eighth note, and then we can half that for a sixteenth note. Because um, half of or half of one fourth is it one eighth, half of one eighth is one sixteenth, right? And it works rhythmically like that, right? So these are going to be twice as fast as the ones before. So if I put a bunch of 16th notes here, we're gonna get this rhythmic speed versus eighth notes, which are gonna have this one, and then quarter notes, right? So this is how we talk about these different divisions of rhythm, but also bear in mind, this is all based on tempo. So how fast an eighth note and a 16th note is, is purely based on how fast the beats per minute is set to on your song. And we can change that up here in Ableton, which I haven't even gotten to yet, especially because Future Bass can kind of be in any tempo you want for the most part. Um, if I was mimicking a lot of the popular music out there right now, I might switch this to 75 because I'm not in halftime and a lot of um, Future Bass music is in 150. Um, so half of 150 is 75 and 150 halftime would have the snare all the way over here. So we put it here. So we can hear what this rhythmic section sounds like at 75 now instead of 120. It's a lot more like a hip-hop beat, right? So maybe I'll go, go back to 100. Um, I was on 120, I know. I like 100. We'll keep it there. So the second question was quantization. Um, quantization is um, something that we can use to help clean up a recording be it audio or MIDI. And so one demonstration I can give is to quantize my hi-hats back to the grid. Because if you guys remember, and you can see, I kind of adjusted these hi-hats so that they're a little bit off the grid, right? If I highlight everything and right-click on the window and go to quantize settings, which by the way, is how I recommend you quantize 100% of the time, unless you're quantizing the same setting over and over again. Because if you hit quantize, it's going to quantize based on your previous quantize settings. So we may want to adjust these depending on what we're doing. And we can see here some rhythmic divisions, right? So I just explained one fourth is a quarter note, one eighth is twice the speed of that, one sixteenth is um, the speed that we want to quantize to probably. But let's see, we only have at most sixteenth notes in this. We don't go any faster than this right here. And these are sixteenth notes, right? So let's highlight everything. Zoom in so we can see the change happen. And then quantize settings, 16th notes. Start means it's going to adjust where the note starts from, which is how we fix a rhythmic time. And then end is going to change the length of the MIDI note, which may or may not affect uh, what you're doing, depending on if it's like triggering samples or uh, quantizing an instrument. So I'm going to turn that off. And then the amount is super important because the amount is how, at, as far as the distance of where it is now and the distance of where you're telling it to go, what percentage of that distance is it going to cover, right? So if I put 0%, they're never going to move. And if I put it on 100%, they're going to snap perfectly to the 16th note grid. So I'm going to do that so we can see it. And note right now that each one of these hi-hats is a little bit off the line, right? But watch what happens when I click OK. They fix themselves right to the line. And so if I was recording this with my hands or with a, a MIDI keyboard like one of these guys over here, I might want to use that quantize feature to fix my playing if I'm not like super in time or if I, I messed up a little bit. We can also do this manually, but quantize feature makes it a lot quicker if you're doing something like that. And so you may see me use that when I record in the chords for this e-piano. So real quick, um, I'm gonna demonstrate that so we can actually get some, some more content to get working with. And again, I'm gonna play something kind of random, kind of not random, so you can see what that's like and then going in and fixing it to, to generate something a little bit more usable. 
So I'm just going to hit the record button. Remember, we're going to get a count of four before I start actually playing something. And then I'll, I'll just I'll hit some notes. Great. Sounds like a sitcom intro. We're going to fix that. <laughs> so we don't want that. Um, this, is, this is supposed to be future bit. It's supposed to be hype, right? So let's make it a little bit more hype. The reason why I did that, even though it didn't sound super great, is because look at what we got now. I have this like major seven chord and a minor seven chord and then like another one and then like some inverted major seven chord or something. So without knowing what these things are or being able to click them in on the grid, I, I can kind of, you know, hit these notes together until I find something that I like. And we can always come in here and reposition these things to generate a more interesting chord progression with them. So let's let's try that right now, right? So again, if you want, we could go in here, highlight everything and quantize so that all of these MIDI notes align properly. And so again, I'm going to turn end off because I'm going to show you another way that we could do this. And because there's not a quick rhythmic division in here, it's at most an eighth note. We're going to switch this to eighth notes and run it in. It seems like it got everything pretty well. And now what I'm going to do is highlight everything and click this legato button over here on the left. And this is going to make sure that the end point of each one of these MIDI notes goes and connects to the next kind of start of MIDI notes. And you'll see what I mean by that when I click it. So now everything is extended out to what we want. So now it's a lot cleaner to work with, right? And I didn't have to like painstakingly move individual notes over and change the size of them. It was like two button clicks to get all of this stuff on the grid um, and easy to use. So with that said, uh, let's come in here and start taking this apart a little bit, right? So we have this major chord it's not bad but it's kind of happy and again i want to make this a little more intense so let's grab the minor chord instead and we'll start with that one and c uh c is not a key i want to write in right now so we're gonna switch this to like uh f sharp why not let's do it um so we're gonna have f sharp minor seven as our starting chord and i don't need to know that to have gotten to this point right that's kind of the the thing i'm trying to um say here is we don't really need to know what i'm looking at here to have gotten to this point um, so now that i have this minor seven chord on the f sharp i'm going to grab this major one and just kind of move it around and in context hear what it sounds like relative to the other chord i plunked got that one got that one that's a little weird that's actually not bad that's that's weird that's pretty good so far and see i'm this is guess and check right now i'm not really making like informed music theory decisions necessarily. I am looking for points where some of these notes overlap a little bit because it's it's maybe helpful indicator that what I'm doing is what we call diatonic or in key. For example, this is the exact same chord, right? Just with a slight adjustment. And so, um, yeah, the, this is all I'm really going to do until I fill out this space, right? And now that I have, you know, I guess this is a unique one, so I'll grab that and delete the rest of this stuff. Let's see how I can maybe use this. Oh. So this is what I mean. I just I hit hit some random keys on the keyboard. This one didn't necessarily end up working out, but I can move these notes around until maybe it does, right? That's a lot better. So Notice how I'm highlighting to check what my chord progression sounds like without having to kind of like play it back over and over again. That is this little headphone symbol again, if you remember. And then we're gonna duplicate this into the next section. So it kind of repeats. And then there are other ways that we could extend this if we want to. We could just put it up to the fifth or hit up on our keyboard, the up, the up arrow five times. And then maybe make some what we call inversions by highlighting some of the chord and changing the octave it's in by holding shift and pressing up or down on the keyboard or you know maybe just one of them something like that we can hear what we got you have a question uh yeah so again music theory definitely deserves its own stream um but Chords are made up of uh, stacks of intervals, right? And so an interval is just the dif distance between two notes. 
and we have major and minor intervals and we call them that just to help identify the difference between them as far as like a communication standpoint is concerned but we've all come to you know grow comfortable with giving major and minor moods also you know we think of major we think of like triumphant or happy or like upbeat positive and then minor we think of like maybe sad or scary or down or more like down um negative right and so I think that's just how humans have naturally responded to music written in minor keys, major keys, respond to minor chords and major chords. But funny enough, all major and minor chords are made up of both a stack of a major and then a minor interval, right? So for a major chord, we have a major third, which is a note that has, or two notes, excuse me, that have three notes in between them, right? So between C and E here, we've got three notes in between. If I play this, we can tell it's kind of like uplifting sounding yeah you know it's like it's it's bringing us up whereas if i move this down one to make it go from a major third to a minor third we get this which sounds a lot more like hmm like maybe i'm not so sure or maybe i'm upset right and so for me to then stack a major third right on top of that minor third we get a minor chord which is the full harmonic feeling of that minor right if I move this back to the major third, it changes this to this, which is the more positive, uplifting major version, right? I'm using different kinds of chords, like what we call these triads, the, the basic major or minor chords. Um, they're just triads, right? Just three notes. Um, I'm taking it a little bit further and adding one more note. And so, for example, we go major third, minor third, and we do another major third because we kind of alternate to get these. Now we have a major seven, right? If I move these both down, we get a minor seven. And so these are the two different types of chords I'm using here. Um, I like using seven chords because they feel a little bit more ambiguous to me, right? Like major very much feels happy and positive and minor very much feels like negative and down tempo. So I like to throw the seven in there to kind of make it, eh, which one is it, eh? So <laughs> um, yeah, we'll, we'll, I'll come back to that if you want. Um, if, I, if I didn't quite get your question, I, I think I got it. So now that we have at least what is good enough for me for the next 30, 45 minutes of chord progression, um, what we're going to want to do is actually kind of pull a baseline out of this, right? Because step two is filling out the frequency spectrum when it comes to our, our song. And so this one I'm actually going to design, right? Because a large part of creating music in Ableton especially is sound design. Like we don't want to use presets all the time. Um, this is a piano, so it, it hurts maybe a little bit less to use a preset because it's an acoustic instrument anyway. Um, Oh, so this is interesting. Notice how my MIDI region has this extra like two beats and some at the end of it. It's a little odd. Um, what we can do is chop that in arrangement view like this, just by kind of highlighting up to here. And then what we would do is turn loop on and make sure that this is a zero and not a two. because that's what's causing that to have the extra space. And now if we want, we can loop this or we can duplicate it and it's nice and in time. Cool. So real quick, while I pull the notes out of this chord progression that are the lowest note of my chord to help me start building a bass line out of this, let's play it back to hear what it sounds like with the drums. Maybe we might want to change the rhythmic placement of some of these chords. So I hear two things that we might wanna do. One, let's move this over so that this is not a consistent rhythmic sequence, right? We're gonna shift the second chord in the measure over to the left, an eighth note. This is immediately going to give this a little bit more groove. Also, I don't like how it goes from this chord to this chord, then back to this chord. So let's just change it, right? Maybe we w might wanna just invert the chord a little bit more to make it sound different. Or maybe we wanna grab a new chord entirely. Um, Honestly, maybe alternating between those will sound right. Yep, I like that a lot better. Cool. So we're, we're running with that right now. And again, I'm going to highlight the individual bass note out of this chord progression. It's kind of like a crafty way of doing that in Ableton. And that's going to be holding shift the entire time I add my highlights. Because what I can do is highlight one, and while holding shift, if I highlight another one, it will add it to what's being highlighted, right? So it makes it very easy for me to oops, select um, notes that are maybe not necessarily all on the bottom because I inverted some of these chords, which means the, the bass note is not actually 
the bottom note. So I'm going to come through here while this is playing and highlight the bottom note out of here, out of these chords, or the root note out of these chords to help with my bass line moving forward. Uh, actually, for convenience sake, let me show you maybe a more efficient way of doing this. We can copy this also right into what I'm going to use for the bass. Now, if you caught that, I didn't really explain it, but I went into instruments and I grabbed an operator. I did not, however, go down into the presets, though, because I want it to be a default version of this sound or of this synthesizer so that I can design a sound from scratch. Um, we'll see how much I get into the sound design thing, but you'll at least get to see it. Um, and again, what I'm trying to do is pull the root note from these chords out. And so maybe instead of highlighting it out of my piano track, I can just copy this MIDI track right into the bass because MIDI is arbitrary. It, it works all across the board. You can copy MIDI from one instrument onto another instrument. Um, and now I'm just going to delete anything that's not the root note, right? And I might turn this off because I haven't designed the sound yet, so it might be a little annoying. But I'm just going to be deleting things out of here that I don't feel like I need, right? So this one was inverted. Got to move that back up, then delete it. Um, this one's also inverted, so this is the original position for that chord. Again, this guy, these ones all are inverted. So I want to make sure that I'm grabbing the right note when I do this. Or else it might sound a little weird. Might have to fix it later. Uh, We'll just do that one. Yeah, that's fine. Again, we'll fix it later if we need to, right? Uh, the other thing we're going to need to do is shift this down, right? Because this is bass, so we need to move this lower and lower on the region. So what I did is just Control A or Command A to highlight everything, and then shift down a couple times to move it lower each by an octave every time. So now if I highlight something, we can tell getting a little closer to bass land, but got to go lower. There we go. That's not bad. Um, you'll get used to what notes can kind of go where. Like for example, I see a B. If I'm crafty with my sound design, I might be able to throw that an octave lower, but it's gonna be kind of tough to get people to hear it. However, this E up here, they'll definitely hear that one an octave lower. So maybe I'm gonna toss that back down there. Uh, again, same thing with this C and C sharp. All three of these notes, you can probably make work down here, but it's gonna be a little bit more challenging because that's really, really low on the frequency spectrum, which means it's gonna be harder for the human ear to just perceive that sound at all. We'll feel it, but that's gonna be more on like, you know, live performance, large speaker system versus, you know, headphones or laptop speakers. This will not come out of your laptop speakers at all, unless you move it up here. So it's up to you how much effort you wanna kind of put into using that region of audio, but again, a little challenging. So. Before I go into designing the sound, I'm going to mute my track and make sure that this bass line fits the uh, harmony that I've placed here. So let's just play these things together. And I've turned off this track by just deactivating this number here. I think that works. I think we've we've gotten some, some good notes here. Um, now that we have this, um, you guys might immediately start hearing a, like a kind of groove for a bass line that we could use. Um, I'm hearing something a little bit more like the, the dance rhythms that we have right now. Something that we call a kind of tree stay, even though it's not a triplet, it kind of sounds and feels like a triplet, like one, two, three, one, two, three, right? So let's actually borrow that rhythm. We're gonna repeat that. Again, this is dance music, so we want it to make you feel like you wanna dance. And this is a really good rhythm when it comes to making you wanna dance. So I'm just going to very quickly here, highlight a note while holding shift and the arrow key, resize it down to what I want, and then copy, click onto the spot that I want to paste it and then paste it. Um, if the note's already there, I just highlight it, resize it, duplicate, duplicate again, move it, duplicate again, move it. It's very easy to move uh, MIDI notes around in Ableton. And this is one of the aspects that I recommend getting comfortable with as soon as possible because this will slow you down a lot if you're not uh, comfortable with it for sure. So now that I have a rhythm I like, I feel like I can kind of go and start designing a sound. What I want to do while I'm designing this instrument is have it play over and over and over again, right? And some of you might have noticed this little flag region up here that we can move around. If I put it over here and then I highlight the region that I want to loop and hit Command or Control L on my keyboard, you'll notice that region jumps over to the area that I've highlighted. And I now have this, this button on, right? Um, this means that my loop is working. And so I can turn it on and off from here. But it also means that I can just sit here and play 
and it's going to play my bass line over and over and over again. So while it's doing that, I can come into the instrument that I've placed down here. This is a whole region of Ableton I haven't talked about yet. This is where instruments and effects go. And I can design my sound with the parameters that we have in here. Um, it is already 740, so I'm not going to talk too much about what I'm doing. I will say, however, Operator is one of the strongest synthesizers in Ableton. I'm not as familiar with Wavetable. I think a lot of people would probably jump to this, especially because it's new. Highly recommend you checking it out. I'm much more comfortable with Operator. I'm old school, so we're going to run with this guy. Uh, it's a type of synthesis that we refer to as FM synthesis, uh, which is stands for frequency modulation. Again, not going to go much further than that, but essentially we're running oscillators into other oscillators to kind of like distort the waveform a little bit. Uh, distort is not necessarily the correct term to use, but gives you a good picture of what we're doing um, to generate new types of waveforms to then kind of, you know, texture our sound. What's up? Yeah, so there's something to keep in mind when you do that. Sometimes having multiple frequencies overlap the bass track can kind of mess with your low end a little bit. So, you know, this is music. Do everything to ear. If you do that, you copy your entire bass track like this, paste it on top of itself, and then move it up an octave so that we have an octave up layer. And it sounds great. Keep it because it sounded great, right? But you might find that it might either push your... Um, your synth a little bit hot into some of the audio effects you have which will create distortion you also might find that we get some what is called phase cancellation where the low end from the top part of your sound is canceling out the low end from the bottom part of your sound which is more important right and so again just use your ears to make sure that it, it, it sounds good but for example let's try it out here it thickens the sound a lot because i haven't really done anything to my sound yet however um, when I'm finished designing it, I might come back in and check it again and make sure it's, you know, still doing what I want it to. Uh, once I've gone through the sound, we'll, we'll do that and see if it helps. Mm. Mm-hmm. This is the most important one for sure. So I double click a note to drop it. Immediately, I click shift and hold shift and then press arrow key right or left. Shift is going to tell it to resize the note instead of just moving it right or left. And since I'm not holding command or control, it's going to snap it to the nearest grid point, right? Um, bear in mind, I can change the division that I'm seeing in the grid by either hitting command or control one and two to make it tighter or looser as far as like how many boxes I'm seeing. I can also zoom in and out so long as I am on adaptive grid so we can right click on the grid and kind of tell it okay I either want you to be only 16th notes which would be like this option or we can choose one of these adaptive grids that says hey I, as I zoom in I want you to show me more boxes as I zoom out I want you to show me less boxes I think um, once you get more and more comfortable with Ableton you'll want to be on that adaptive grid just because it is a lot quicker um, for accessing those like tighter rhythms but you'll 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 decide what you like to use Yeah, so when I'm using the word inversions, here, let me duplicate a new MIDI track over here. So let's just look at these two chords right here, because these chords are what we call in are in root position, right? So this is a F minor and a G major. The reason why they're in root position is because we got an F sharp, so excuse me, F sharp minor and a G major. F sharp is on the very bottom. So this is what we call the root note, because it's a F sharp chord, right? So this would be where I would look to for a bass note. There are other bass notes we can use on, under this chord, bear in mind, you don't have to use that note, but I know in my head, guarantee it's going to sound good because that's the root note. And so it's a really good starting point. However, sometimes we do something to chords called inversion or an, an inversing a chord or an inversion of a chord, which is when the root note of the chord is no longer on the bottom, right? So if I highlight those two and move it up an octave, now the lowest note in that chord is an A and a B. Neither of those are the root note of the chord. If I put an A or a B in the bass, it might not sound good. It also might sound good, but again, I know for a fact that these two notes will sound good in the bass. And so regardless of if this is the inversion you're in, or this one, or this one, 
we need to keep that in mind because your root note and your base notes always going to be these two as far as what I was doing to, to come up with a good starting point. Again, you do not need to use these notes for your bass line. Like this is music, whatever sounds good, roll with that. And in fact, we might change some of these bass notes a little later on to add some spice to this. But again, starting point, it makes it very easy to kind of just plunk in a bass line. Um, and then, you know, you'll hear where changes might need to be made. Like there's a lot of jumping back and forth here. Like maybe I'll add something in between. That might sound better, but again, I'm not gonna do that until I have the sound I wanna use for it. So while this plays, um, and for now we're gonna do this on uh, solo. So all I'm hearing is this bass by clicking the, the blue S right here. You can turn it off like that. Um, but it's gonna help me hear what I'm working on while I'm working on it. And I can just let this play on loop while I make some adjustments. Um, a really important term to be aware of when it comes to music production is an envelope or envelopes. Um, an envelope is the shape of a parameter or a sound. And I know that might be a little bit tough to understand at first, but I'll, I'll demonstrate it here. Um, an envelope is broken up into kind of four different values, which are A, D, S, and R. That stands for attack, decay, sustain, and release. And they all affect a sound or a parameter in a very like specific way. Um, attack is going to be how long a sound or parameter takes to get to full value or full volume or full velocity. Decay is going to be how long a sound or value takes to get down to the sustain point or value. And the sustain point or value is going to be what it sits at while a note is held, right? So for example, right now, the shape is not doing much, right? We have no attack, so it's starting right away. We have a decay time, but it doesn't matter because our sustain is all the way up, right? So if I come in here and start adjusting these values a little bit, like turn the decay down, and then turn the sustain down, we actually see the shape of this envelope change and we'll hear it. We can hear the little pluck at the beginning and then it fades down to that sustain value. So you notice how attacks in milliseconds, decays in milliseconds, releases in milliseconds, I didn't even talk about yet, and then sustains in decibels. Well, that's because attack, decay, and release, those are all amounts of time that the, su the sound sustains for, whereas sustain is the value or volume or velocity at which the note is going to rest at while you're holding a note, like on your keyboard, or while a MIDI note inside the grid is being held, right? So while you hold this, it will stay at that sustained value. With that said, release is how long the sound takes to fade out to nothing once the note is let go of, or once the MIDI note is no longer active, right? And so, since we're writing a bass line, we're gonna wanna make something that's a little bit more, you know, fitting of a bass sound. And so for something like this, especially cause we're going kind of like the EDM dance future route, um, I'm gonna want something a little bit pluckier and a little dancier. So I'm gonna make the shape of a pluck, right? Which is no attack cause it hits right away and then it fades out very quickly. So while I'm playing this part, I'm going to adjust these values until I'm satisfied with the shape of the sound. In fact, it's already pretty close, right? Because there's no attack here. In fact, I might add a little bit to help get rid of that little pop at the beginning. Decay is gonna go somewhere between one and two seconds, probably. And then release, we need a little bit because we can hear the sound cutting itself off because 40 milliseconds is too quick, right? So let's crank this up a bit. Now it fades out a little bit nicer. And the sustain is all the way down because we want this to be kind of like a pluck. We want it to fade out to nothing, kind of like maybe plucking a bass guitar would, right? So now we can come in here and use some of the other aspects of the synth to add texture to the sound. For example, this is just a sine wave right now, but if we run another sine wave even more into it than we are now, we can hear our sound gains more upper harmonics and becomes a lot more textured, right? So. We can also change the envelope of these sounds so that they affect our pluck differently. And now we're getting closer to like a dance bass. Did you have a question? Oh. Um, reiterate, um, any particular aspect um, was confusing so when we're looking at this grid this is kind of like the shape of the sound so if you can imagine when the lines at the bottom here the sound doesn't play as the line travels up the sound gets louder and louder and louder and so you can kind of get a good visual representation of what 
an envelope means or what ADSR is affecting just from looking at these points, right? So with that said, if I move this point over here, I'm extending the length of the attack because I'm making it take longer to actually start the sound. And we should be able to hear that as I move this over. You can hear it now it fades in over time versus just starting right away. Um, there are other things at play here to kind of change how that sounds, but this is going to be, you know, how long does our sound stick around for? Is it like really sharp and staccato or is it kind of like a string instrument? And so for the most part, we could kind of break down the ADSR of a bunch of different styles of sound. So for example, wind instruments, they all have a higher attack, right? Because it's impossible to get that like really sharp impact out of a wind instrument. You're blowing into it. You have to have an acceleration of air to get sound to come out of that instrument. And so we're going to add time to our attack value if we're trying to mimic a wind instrument, right? So this is kind of what we do to um, push sounds closer to instruments. For example, if I bring a blank operator down here, it sounds like this. Excuse me, it sounds like this. Doesn't sound like much, right? If I just change the shape of the sound a little bit, lower the attack, or sorry, excuse me, lower the sustain, extend the decay a little bit and add some release. Without changing the texture of the sound at all, it sounds a lot more like a piano now, right? Because I've mimicked the shape of a piano. When the mallet strikes the string on a piano, we get that initial um, decay, which is what the decay value is representing. The sustain value is meant to represent kind of at what point we're able to hold the key, which is a little bit like because you can't hold a piano note forever, but I, it's the best we got here. And then and, um, our release, right? When you strike a piano note and let go real quick, it sticks around for a little bit. It doesn't just stop right away. So even without changing the texture of the sound, um, we've, we've made your brain feel more like it's a piano, right? So ADSR gives us a lot of control over the way that um, our sound design works and what instruments we're using, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so right now I'm trying to make kind of like a dance bass, right? And so now that we have a little bit more going on, I'll play this in conjunction with everything else we have here. I like this. Um, I think I'm gonna move this up an octave to make a separation between these two halves. Um, and I think we're good to move on to the next section. Um, Cause as I said, I'm trying to move pretty quick here. Again, we've already ran it a little bit out of time. I'm gonna move a little bit probably later, but that's okay, that's okay. Um, so with my drums, now that we have all of this, I think we're in a position to actually start arranging just a little bit, just a little bit to help us get closer to where we're going. So um, let's do something basic to save time. So I'm going to start with just the piano. So we're gonna get rid of this drum track and move it over here. I don't need all these extra ones. Then we're gonna have the bass come in with the drums. Cool. Um, then it's going to drop into like a build section maybe where, um, I don't know, we'll, we'll maybe add some cool filtering or something there, but the drums will change. So instead of having the kick and snare go, it'll be maybe just the hi-hats. And we'll maybe change the snare to, to whatever that tom is. And then maybe we'll add more rides, right? So this is what I mean about just making some variety of drums here. Um, maybe we'll do like a fill. I did leave that first kick there, but maybe I'm going to change it to the one that's going to play during our main drop or chorus section to help kind of like, you know, tickle the listener's ear, give them an idea of what's about to come. Um, and then we have our main section over here. So again, I remember I grabbed those extra drums so that I could switch it up for the main section. All I'm going to do is highlight the kick, move it down, highlight the snare, move it up, and then maybe add, you know, more rides maybe to follow the snare and now i have this extra percussion that we can come in and, and splice into this beat for the main section to make it a little bit more interesting so i'm going to do that real quick before i add any sounds here down a couple of times good enough <laughs> it's a little weird but we'll rock with it for a bit um, but we'll notice how the drums go from being a little bit chill to taking a break for builds and then it gets a lot more intense right so 
that's that's part of the the arrangement of drums for future bass for sure um one thing i'll tell you is this snare not quite cutting it it's too acoustic so i could switch it out i could layer stuff with it or i could use an audio effect Ooh, here we go i didn't even talk about this stuff yet i'm sorry um <laughs> one of the most common audio effects i think that people are going to be using and interfacing with is the eq so if we go back over to the left side of the screen here and see audio effects i can identify eq8 is going to be the one that we want to use and because I want to just affect this snare drum, I'm going to drag and drop this directly onto the snare drum. If I put this over here on the other side of the drum rack, it's going to process everything inside the drum rack together. But I only want the snare, so we're going to put it inside the snare panel. And now, I can use this to help kind of create a more future bass EDM-esque snare from what we've got. So I'm going to boost the transient, which is that little bump down there to make it more punchy. And I'm also going to boost the high end because, you know, future bass snares have an impossibly bright high end. There we go. And right away, without, underwater, with, future bass, right? Um, I might also add a glue compressor. It would take me the rest of the time to explain how this thing works. But what I'm going to do with this device is actually make this snare punchier. I may actually add a little bit of intentional distortion to my sound as well because that's kind of a future based thing. So what I would do to do that is make sure soft clip is on and then crank this makeup gain a lot. I would then need to compensate for how loud that becomes somewhere else, like maybe with another EQ or a utility tool afterwards. Also, sometimes this doesn't work all that great, but try it. There we go. And then lower the gain. go so if i turn all of this stuff off as a group by the way we can group stuff by highlighting everything together by holding shift and clicking on all of it and then hitting command g so it's all one thing i can now turn it all on and off at one time to make it easier to hear the difference so we have this before and then we turn it into like that's that's a pretty important difference we just did to that snare right and so it's going to take a while for you to become super comfortable with all these audio effects to the point where you can maybe target an, a sound that you need and then immediately just go right to it. But on that note, experiment, experiment, experiment. Like even with my, as I mentioned, like 20,000 hours or something like that, I'm still spending so much time in Ableton just experimenting because this is audio. We can't, I can sit here and explain to you how this stuff works all day, but unless you spend time hearing how it works and not just hearing how it works but hearing how it works on every different kind of sound there is that's how we get comfortable with it. and that's how we really learn what this stuff does because this is music it's an audio thing it's not a this is not sound physics class like it kind of is but that doesn't really help us create music right so um yeah let me let me finish this future based song in five minutes right so we have our uh, intro drums we have our build drums and we have our drop drums we're gonna leave those as is because we're fine with that um, we do need to make this build section feel like a build section. So let's add what we call an automation to this piano. The way that I'm going to do that is with an EQ. So we're going to grab another EQ from our audio effects. And real quick, I'm going to do a little bit of processing. I'm going to shelf out the low end of this E piano to help with the mix later on. And then I'm going to add a what is called a low pass filter or a high cut filter to this EQ on number eight by selecting this bottom shape right here. And now you'll hear as I sweep with this, I have control over the presence of this piano sound. So what I wanna do is make sure that I can see an automation lane. What an automation is, as the word automation would suggest, is we're going to have something in Ableton adjusting this parameter for us. It's we're gonna automate that parameter to move so we don't have to manually do it. And the way we're going to do that is by up here, we're going to turn on our automation lines. You're going to see that each track now has this red dotted line here. That red dotted line is going to be attached to the last parameter you touch on that track. That's important because you'll notice as I adjust this, ni neither of the red lines on my other tracks are changing because they're only related to things on that track specifically. So I'm going to adjust this frequency because that's what I want. And then at the end of the intro, I'm going to have a little dip so that it's kind of like naturally falling down out of the scene. And we can see this move as it follows the line. So I don't want it to go that low. I still want you to be able to hear it a little bit. 
and then we're gonna let this build back in over time, but not that soon. So I wanna bend this line down. I can hover near this kind of segment of this automation until it highlights blue like this. If I hit option, and excuse me, I don't quite remember what it is on, um, oh no, on uh, PCs. But if I hit option, you'll see I get this kind of curve, like this parenthesis shows up next to my mouse. I can click and drag to bend this automation line. Um, very important for making things smooth. You might've seen me do that to this one already. And so now we have this kind of go away. And if I was maybe trying to help um, instill the effect of this being a build, I might even do the same thing to my drums, but maybe with the softer low pass filter so it doesn't cut everything out too much, right? So we'll do the same thing here just to help this feel like it's actually building up to something. Might also need to change the ADSR value on this kick drum in here because it's a little distorted and there's kind of something at the end of it we don't like. So I'm gonna come into here. I'm gonna switch this to classic in the drum rack. This is our kick drum I'm referring to. And I'm just gonna lower the sustain to nothing to make sure that this decay value is in control of how long my sample plays for. And I'm gonna set it somewhere around a second. That makes that sound a little bit cleaner. So we can move on from there. And um, I, the last thing I need to do before I add the, the, the main section and I talk about um, some future based synth stuff is to add a little bit of transitional things. Um, there's a lot of different ways to go about this. And I think usually people will just grab them from their sample pack folders, but I like to be a little more crafty than that. So what we're gonna do is duplicate our drum rack. So now we have two of them right on top of each other. Just highlight the track and hit Command D. And then what we're going to do is we're going to isolate out a bunch of individual sounds from this drum rack. So I've just deleted everything out of this and we're just gonna grab like a kick drum and then a little bit down the way, I'm gonna add the other kick drum, a little bit down the way, I'm gonna add like this hi-hat and then we can do the, the big, big snare I made. And then we'll also definitely do some of these um, toms as well or the bongos or congos, whatever these are. And then I do actually want to move these apart. So if I solo this right now, actually that's plenty of space. So I've, I've actually made these two whole measures apart. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drown this track in reverb. So I'm gonna go back over to this audio effects, which is where we're gonna find our reverb. And I'm gonna select reverb. And I'm gonna double click to add it to the track because I'm, I'm highlighted on the track. So it will drop it right at the end there. And what I'm going to do is, oh, definitely wanna delete this EQ because that copied over from our previous drum track. I'm actually gonna turn the dry wet all the way up. Now, dry wet at the bottom right hand here is the amount of reverb versus the amount of the original audio. And so if I have this all the way down, there's no reverb. If I have this at 50-50, we're getting 50% of the effect sound and then 50% of the original track, which would be a lot more natural. But I don't want this to be natural. I want this to be intense. So we're gonna crank that all the way up to 100%. And I'm even gonna turn the reverb up by cranking this diffuse and reflect value. And then from here, I'm pretty good. Um, if I play this, we can hear it. It's not bad, but it's a little short. So we're gonna look for some way to change the length of time. And we can see down here, we have decay time. So I'm gonna make that, let's say four seconds, somewhere closer to four seconds. There we go. So now we can hear, excuse me, uh, the, the reverb tail on, on that drum sound. So what I'm gonna do now is something that Ableton has access to, which is a beautiful time saver, which is something called freeze and flatten. Um, this is something that I highly recommend you getting comfortable with doing for a few different reasons. But if we right click on this drum rack, we'll see freeze track. If I click freeze track, we get a little like export window that pops up for a second here because it's actually creating a piece of audio for whatever's on that track, including the audio effects. And you'll see it grays out or blues out in my instance, this whole entire track, which means I can no longer make any adjustments to the effect or the instrument itself. However, I can move these chunks around still. Um, if I then, however, right click and hit flatten, it's going to turn that into a real piece of audio. It gives you that midway point so that you can go back, make an adjustment, refreeze. Um, freezing helps clear the CPU load off of your computer. So Ableton is not such an intense program. Um, but once you flatten, you'll see it actually gives me the audio for all of those individual hits with reverb. I can now cut these up into their own individual audio effects. And if I play them, you'll notice 
we have some cool like impacts and stuff right so that's the kick that's another kick my hat snare tom tom and tom this one's kind of unnecessary we'll get rid of that one um so i'm gonna kind of dot these around my track so that they help transition between sections right so if i insert an audio track because right now we're dealing with audio Freeze and Flatten has turned this MIDI track into an audio track for these. Um, I can grab one like, maybe that one. That one's nice and soft. And I'll add that to the section right before the drums come in. If I double click on this audio, Ableton's going to give me a lot of control over what to do with this audio down here. Now, I didn't have too much time to talk about warping, so we're not going to worry about warping. Warping is how you actually adjust um, the shape or length of group. A piece of audio via these markers so you'll see I can add two markers and then kind of stretch this um, I do recommend experimenting with that but it's a long explanation so I'm gonna I'm gonna skip it for now what I really wanted to mention is this rev button next to edit and save this is actually gonna reverse our audio so that we can have this impact sweep into the section instead of um, just uh, hit right in the middle there I then want to add a fade to this to kind of make sure that it's a clean sweep and so I'm gonna turn off my automation lines especially because I don't want to see them when I don't need them anyway. And that will enable these four squares to come up, which will allow me to create a fade on the edge of this so that it sweeps in in volume. So now we can hear that with everything else. I'll probably turn this track down by lowering the volume here a little bit. So you can hear how that really helps kind of transition into the next section but we might want to add one of these guys instead. So we can add the impact on the other end. And I just turned that volume down here a little bit. So now we can hear. Great. So we have a sweep into an impact. Uh, it's definitely helping this transition a little bit, but I might want, want to even add a little bit more reverb to this just to help them kind of flow together a bit. And I'm not even going to touch this. It's just going to be the default reverb and we're going to move on. Um, so again, I'm going to dot these around so that they kind of help transition between these different sections of our track. Um, maybe add the Congo or whatever that sound even is right there. Have this one reverse into it. Again, we definitely want to add our fades. Cool. So this is great. Added some reverb to it, done some freezing and flattening to create some audio effects and some transitions, right? Um, so, other than the big sweep right here, which basically I will probably just layer a multitude of these that we just created. So, not only that one, but we'll add an audio track beneath that and add this one, and also add an audio track beneath that and add this one. Um, if we're being crafty, we could even add some panning to these. If you don't know, panning is which speaker a sound is coming out of left and right. So maybe pan uh, this guy to the left and pan this guy to the right to make this a little bit more stereo and interesting. Turn these guys down. Great. And now we've got the area where our main section is. Um, the hi-hats do seem to be a little bit weird here, so maybe I'll switch to my other hi-hat. So even more variations on the drum. Yeah, that's better. Okay. So I'm going to probably use the same bass here just to save time. So we're going to duplicate this operator track and kind of bring in some of the audio here. Um, generally, I would probably try and rearrange some of the chords that I've used in my progression to just create some variety for what the progression is doing in the drop. So I wouldn't exactly just be duplicating my chord progression into the main section. However, I'll probably do that here for now just to save time. Um, main thing I want to do to this bass is just make it a lot more impactful. So we're going to give it its sustain back so that I can decide how long a note is held for. And we're not going to follow this kind of dance bass because that's a little bit more geared towards like a four on the floor rhythm. And we're opening up the section for the future bass part, right? So we're going to have the effects in this bass synth ha swell more than they do pluck, right? So we're going to have shapes more like this. We can hear what that does to the bass sound. This would be an 
excellent opportunity to bring up an Ableton audio effect called Saturator. Um, works wonders on uh, low-end information, pretty much anything to be fair, but if you're having a hard time spicing up a bass, Saturator is definitely a wonderful tool to do that. Um, again, I'm trying to go pretty quick here, so I'm not going to talk about really what a Saturator is doing to the sound, but it's kind of like a form of distortion depending on what Saturator you're using, and as you can hear, it helps beef, beef up the sound, right? Adds more upper harmonics to it. Makes it a little bit more uh, interesting. Um, but that's good enough for what we're doing here. And we do make sure, want to make sure that we're kind of following a similar key or chord progression here, but I might make a little bit of a change to it. So maybe we'll just have these three kind of repeat and be our line. So it'll go F sharp, G, and then E. Because... That's kind of what our chord progression does, minus the B up here. So we'll see what happens. It's a little odd, but uh, we'll, we'll roll with it. And we'll play with the drums to make sure that it's not damaging the bass. Because the saturator can be a little bit uh, touchy, but it does sound pretty fine, right? And in fact, I think I know I'm going to want to cut these on the snare. have that just repeat quarter notes and when it comes to future bass the sound design is kind of specific right um, I'm gonna bring in that analog tool that I was mentioning before that is kind of a simple basic synthesizer to talk about kind of what the future bass sound came from and when we're looking at oh no Scarlet no interface no We love the focus, right? Please sponsor us, focus, right? Uh oh. Is the push worth the investment for in search of genre here? I am the worst person to ask that question to. I don't like the push very much. Um, I probably shouldn't even say that on stream from the 343 uh, music stream, right? But um, I find that um, people who are just now getting into music production will benefit from the push a lot more than people who have probably been um, developing their own workflow already. I think my issues with the push are they get in the way of the way that I've been doing things for years, right? And so I've got that kind of like old bogey brain where I don't like the push because it gets in the way of what I'm used to. Um, I would definitely say that the push is an excellent workflow tool. Um, it does a really good job of keeping you kind of off the computer and more hands on a device that feels a lot more like an instrument, right? Um, so it can make Ableton feel a little bit less like programming and a little bit more like playing music, which is really cool. Um, it also is a wonderful tool for live performance. So if you're planning on ever transferring what you do in Ableton to a live performance setting and not just using you know, regular standard DJ turntables, the push is going to be a huge tool for opening you up to some really cool stuff for live performance. So I would say, um, coming from someone who's worked at Guitar Center before, budget-wise, it's a little expensive for what it is. So you know, bear in mind that it is that, and there are alternatives to the push. The biggest difference is the screen. You're getting a really nice... Um, display for feedback from the push that you wouldn't get from one of the other third-party devices. Um, however, if it fits within your budget and you do feel like you'll maybe be doing some live performance and you're not already super comfortable with an instrument or Ableton itself, highly recommend. Um, uh, one of our other instructors, Daltrick, she's like a wizard with the push. I would definitely recommend talking to her about it. Um, if she does a live stream tuning into one of those, um, she'll answer any questions I'm sure she's going to be doing some of these um, online courses moving forward too. So uh, maybe finding one that she's involved in and getting in, uh, into that, you'll learn a lot about the push and how to use it. So do I like it? No, and I'm sorry that the answer is no. Do I recommend it? Actually, yeah, probably, unless you feel like it would get in the way of your workflow. Um, I was probably answered that question for too long, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so sorry, now that I've got uh, sound back, which we should be able to hear, okay? I want to talk about kind of what 
the original future bass sound came from, and that's just two saw waves that have been detuned from each other. When I say tuned, I mean right now we have two saw waves that are playing the same note. Right? If I turn one off, it sounds like this. Turn the other one. Here we go. It's like we've got them both together, right? So we have two saw waves playing the same frequency, right? If I adjust the frequency of one of those saw waves away from the other one just a little bit, which is called detuning, which you can see from this detune knob here, listen to what happens to the sound. And I'll play a chord to make it even ob more obvious. Do you hear how that becomes a lot softer? Um, that is essentially the sound of future bass, right? So I'm not necessarily going to use analog to create a sound like that because, again, simple, so challenging. Um, but when I'm creating the, the, the synth, I'm probably going to be going after that effect. Whether I'm going to do so by detuning two sawtooth waves or, or not is up to me, but um, that is definitely kind of like the, the sound we're going for, right? So I'm going to use operator. I'm going to change these routing options so that it's not D into C, C into B, B into A, but instead B into A and then separately D into C. And I can do that by clicking on the kind of like stack of boxes here. And selecting a different shape so as i said i want b into a and d into c so that's going to be the little square guy here so i'm going to switch to the square what that's going to enable me to do is select a sawtooth wave for a and a sawtooth wave for c play them in conjunction with each other and add a little bit of detuning to one so you see i've sent this one out like 15 cents is actually the the measurement for fine tuning like this from this one, which is in home pitch. So now if I play these on top of each other, we can hear the detuning, right? Versus. There's another feature in operator that kind of does this for us, which is this spread. The difference between spread and what I've just done is it's actually going to spread the sound out in stereo as well, which is going to make it wider, which will actually help us for the effect that we're going for. So I'll actually add a little bit of spread to this as well. You might notice that more than I did because I have headphones, one single headphone in. I'm not hearing stereo. Um, I also lowered the volume of the sound because since we have two oscillators playing on top of each other now, it's a little loud. Uh, I could have lowered the level of the oscillators as well, which might not be a bad idea, but you have a volume adjustment here in addition. And now I want to add a little bit of texture to this, which is why I did this in operator instead of analog. And so for this top one, I'm going to choose noise. And in fact, this is going to be noise loop, so I can actually raise the, the pitch of this and adjust the way that it sounds. And then I'm going to run this into one of my sawtooths, but I need to be, make sure that I'm aware of at what point I do this because it is pretty touchy. As you can hear. You can break up the audio in kind of a strange way. And sometimes it doesn't work at all, so maybe we won't. But I will recommend spending some time to come in and add some processing from the synth add a bit of variety to what's going on here. Um, loop something in, which is a little bit trickier, but I can turn the loop on down here so that it actually loops this envelope shape into here. Let's do the on 16th note, that's too fast. Let's go to like quarter notes. So it could be worse, but we're going to go with that for now. Um, this would be another perfect opportunity to use an EQ. It kind of helps shelf off the low end. Maybe cut out the frequency that you combine the part of the floor and not just too strong. There's some like pretty angry stuff right here. Just add a dip to that to make it a little bit more pleasant. I would also recommend using something like a saturator. on wave shaper mode we could go a little crazy with this but i don't have enough time to really spend the time to make it really good so i won't and then the last thing i'm going to do is add an auto filter to this track and auto filter is pretty cool it's a very basic eq shape 
um, call an LFO on it. And this is going to be pretty relevant to um, future bass. There's actually kind of two different ways we can go about making the synth change rhythmically. And it's going to be either through a filter or through a volume shaper. And auto pan, for lack of a better term, is a volume shaper. So I'm going to turn both of these off and plunk some MIDI notes down here because I need to get something down first. Now I said I'm going to take this chord, this chord, and then this chord. And that's going to be our chord progression. We're going to see how that works. <laughs> um, so I'm going to copy those three chords into our operator synth. Move this down. This is not a very good resolving chord, so this is what I mean about changing the stuff later. Let's pick a better chord to resolve to, right? So. So to me, that feels like it's probably going to resolve a little bit better. So we'll switch that bass note from the E to the D that it now is. to keep this rhythmically coherent. And so now that we have our synth kind of placed there, we can come in here with either one of these two rules, and I'll show you how to do it in both, and make rhythmic variation through automation in this sound. Um, there's a lot of different ways we, we could have handled the rhythmic variation. We can duplicate the synth so that we have one doing one rhythm, one doing another rhythm, and alternate between them. We can automate one of these tools for it. Um, there, there's a lot of different ways you can go about that. Um, I find that this is a pretty easy one. And personally, I like volume automation for synths like this versus a filter because that you get too much texture from the filter itself. So I'm gonna use the auto pan personally. Uh, it's up to you what you like. And then we definitely want reverb on this sound. So I'm just gonna add a default reverb with the dry wet turned a bit down at the end of it here which will help it feel a little bit less just dry and in your face, right? So if we turn the amount of this auto pan up, we're gonna see these orange and blue lines kind of alternating. This is going to swim my synth back and forth on, from the left and the right speaker, but that's not what I want. I want this to adjust the volume entirely. So I need to adjust this phase so that these overlap with each other. Since it's no longer gonna be automating the uh, right and left speaker volume alternately it's going to be doing it at the same time we're just going to hear this as a um, basically a volume lfo now i can change the rate to be in time by clicking this little uh, musical note symbol and this is what we're going to be automating right so example one over eight is eighth notes so if i go find that and play this and then adjust this while it plays we can hear what i can do <laughs> So this is how we start to add some more, you know, rhythmic catchiness, for lack of a better term, to the progression that we've got. I'm also going to combine these into one piece of MIDI with Command J just to make it easier to see. And now again, we got to turn on our automation tracks. And um, this is going to be a little random, so forgive me, but let's see if we can plunk in some rhythmic variation here that sounds cool, shall we? So maybe we'll start with... So we'll start with a long one and then a little short hit and then we'll make it go a little faster. That's a little weird. Oh, one thing I definitely forgot to mention, we need to adjust the offset time um, so that it is, it, this LFO rhythmically makes a little bit more sense. Um, we can see when I adjust this, it kind of moves, it shifts the whole thing over. So we do need to make sure that this is where we want it. Um, I do believe uh, 180 degrees is gonna sound pretty good. Yeah, that sounds a little bit more rhythmically in time. This is also something we can automate though, bear in mind. Like I do kind of like how that first one starts. So I'm gonna have it start like that and then I'll automate it up to 180 for this section. Don't be afraid to add some automations. You also notice it has that little like glitch where it does it like it's got an even quicker rhythm in there. That's a happy accident. We're going to leave that because we like it. Um, definitely a lot of what goes into music production is happy accidents left and right. Like if you think of your favorite song and then you think of the coolest thing in your favorite song, that was probably not intentional. Let's 
we'll switch that back to maybe eighth notes instead. And then we'll give him some triplets because, you know, who doesn't love triplets, man? Come on. Which is going to be 1 over 12. <laughs> And then maybe I'll just copy this automation line over, making sure to not highlight the entire tab up here, or else I'm going to copy uh, the MIDI over to just this intersection duplicated over. And now we got two of the same, and I can make a little bit of a variation here if I want, like maybe have it start with one of these kind of effects. Here we go. <laughs> And then maybe I'd come in here and add a little bit of variation to the notes in here as well. Um, again, inversion is a wonderful way of doing that. So it goes. So we're gonna have it go um, down, right? So the the general top note is falling, and then we're gonna have it go up. So the general bass note is rising. Great, so this is already starting to sound pretty good. Um, one thing I would note is definitely take advantage of negative space. So for example, this synth just goes the whole time. So if we add a little break right here, um, that would be a good opportunity for us to maybe use um, one of those return tracks I mentioned before and add a bunch of extra reverb to the snare here. So I could right click, insert return track, put a reverb on it. We definitely want to make sure that the dry wet is set to 100% though, because if I don't, then we're going to overlap the original audio onto itself and it's just going to make it louder. And that's going to be a little bit weird and disconcerting. Um, I'll crank the amount of this reverb up too, because why not? And then we're going to automate this value right here, because this value, you, you might've noticed this didn't exist until I added the return track right here is how we send this track into that reverb now. So I'm just going to add a little bit to that snare only means I need to adjust so anything else in the drum track. There we go. So just snare. You can hear how big that extra reverb becomes once that snare hits. I might even force that high end to just be more present. Um, this is an EQ inside the, the reverb that lets us control the tone of the reverb. It's fantastic. So yeah, now we have a little bit of variation from the drums, the bass, we have a drop synth. Um, I think we're at about the point in time where we just need to play the song and see what it sounds like. Um, we have transition effects. We have, ah, we don't have a melody. Oh no, okay. So a <laughs> um, couple of different things we can do. We can duplicate our chord progression and slap a MIDI effect on there because I didn't actually really talk about any of the MIDI effects. We're gonna go with arpeggiator. If you put it on the track, you'll notice it goes in front of the instrument. That's kind of unique. Um, MIDI effects are the only thing that go in front of an instrument um, because it's essentially going to be affecting these notes before they hit this synthesizer, right? So you'll notice if I solo this track and then play it, it's separating the chords out into individual notes, right? So if I then switch this instrument out by maybe searching pluck into the presets, let's maybe find one. Really this is a little odd. Oh, terrible, it's not. Oh my, what is going on here? There we go. I hate it too, but we're gonna roll with it. Um, spread that out a little more. So we do have control here within the arpeggiator settings for maybe how snappy the sound is versus held. I like snappy. Um, how fast this plays, right? So this would be maybe another thing we would want to automate. But we also have control over how it reads the chord progression and then picks notes out of there, uh, out of it from the notes in the chord progression. So right now it's starting with the bottom note and going up. We can invert that by starting with the top note and going down, or we can alternate kind of on the way in. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different options here, so I would definitely just mess around and find which one generates a more appropriate melody for your song. So let's try that with 16 notes. Or sorry, excuse me, uh, eighth notes. And I'll also add a little bit of reverb to this because, you know, this is future based, there's reverb everywhere. And it'll also help this blend into the song a little bit better. Okay. So we'll have that come in in our verse and in our build, but we won't have that play for the main section necessarily.
right? So we kind of have like our main sections of the song because from this point forward, it's pretty much up to you to repurpose some of these things for the other sections of your song, um, add some variety to them, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the melody ended up working out pretty okay. Um, maybe a move would be to then duplicate that exact same melody, that was the bass, and make the synth a lot more of a lead sound instead of a pluck, but it will still do the exact same. do the exact same uh, progression so maybe if I switch this out we go from here um, it's got a little flux synth ah unsuccessful <laughs> So we still have this automation going. So oops, daisies, that's my bad. So we can hear how maybe transferring into a more lead type of uh, probably not something I would do for this track, but you do get the idea, I think. And then there's one last thing, very very last thing I'm gonna note before I sign off here and answer some questions. When I play this, you notice how this meter in the bottom right hand corner as the track is going. That means that I'm I'm too hot. The fact that I'm only going just above the line there is not too bad, and it in fact might be making my song sound a little bit thicker. However, we're gonna want to make sure that I'm I'm kind of keeping note of that and either processing and producing my song with that in mind, or I'm making an adjustment to fix it. Uh, the way that I would go about that is highlighting everything by selecting the bottom track and while holding Shift, then also selecting the top track to get everything in between. We can then adjust the volume here. Um, Bear in mind, if you have an automation on that volume, you would need to put that track into a group to do this, or else it's going to try and change the value of something being automated, which Ableton can't do, right? That's telling a value to be two different things at the same time. Um, so now with the volume of all of these tracks reduced, you can see I'm no longer crossing zero, and I'm not distorting the track. We should make it sound a little bit clear. Um, something that you can do as a safety net and that will also kind of help just make your track sound a little bit better as you work would be to add a glue compressor and a limiter in that order to your master channel um, and you can leave this on as you work so long as your values look very similar to mine here you're going to want your threshold to be all the way up to zero and your makeup to be either be off or somewhere in between off and one decibel um, soft clip being on is the only important thing here because we don't really want this to change the, the quality of our song, we just want it to keep it from clipping, which is what the soft clip does. Then the limiter is the hard limit. So it's definitely not gonna let it go above zero, even if we really try. Like we can send a really hot signal into there and it will cut it down to zero. Um, and so you'll see it does increase the output volume of my track a little bit. Um, but this is kind of the beginnings of the mastering process, right? Like if I wanted to just export this little bit real quick to show my friend what I would probably do is lower this threshold a little bit until we see it get closer to that vibe until we hear it affect the drums and maybe a more negative way and then I'm gonna crank this makeup gain until it's a little bit bad and then reel it back a bit right so Combine these guys as I do and turn them on and off. You can hear the difference. It's, it's a pretty sizable difference in loudness there. We definitely don't call this a master, but you're at least getting your track closer to industry standard of volume. And so if you're like sharing it with a friend or with another collaborator, it can kind of help them hear what you're working towards, um, if that makes sense. Um, so with that said, I went 30 minutes over as I always do with these things. Sorry, not sorry. Please provide me with questions so I can provide you with answers. Unless you don't have any, then my bad again. <laughs> you got anything?
guys are going to have to uh, watch me just sit there and stare at the, the camera while I wait for you to answer my questions. <clears throat> oh, we got... Um, yeah, so I would answer that question in a couple different ways. Um, the first thing I would note is there is no answer to that question. Um, cause if we think about like a singer songwriter performing at a bar, it could just be their voice and their acoustic guitar. Right. And I would say that's a two song or a two instrument song. Um, if you consider the instrument, a voice, which, or a vo the voice an instrument, which I do. Um, or if you could imagine like a whole orchestra, that's a whole bunch of individual instruments playing, right? And so it, it very much depends on the genre of music. Like I would say trap, for example, as a genre is a little bit more simple. There's a lot less going on, which means you have to do more with the little you're using. Whereas, you know, dubstep, we're jumping between different synthesizers all the time, different synth sounds, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's a lot more going on. Um, there's a lot more instruments in a song like that. So I would not necessarily answer that question with a number or with a list, but what I would say is there are ways that we can kind of break apart what goes into a song in a more simplified way. Um, and the most simple way that I could possibly imagine doing that would say you have drums, you have bass, you have melody, and you have harmony. And so, for example, we have drums here. Obviously, we've got these guys. We have bass, right? We have harmony, which is going to be your chord progression or your vocal harmonies or what have you, and we also have melody. And so, oops, sorry, that's the bass again, my bad. <laughs> we have melody. Um, so how many instruments you decide to, you know, cover those elements with is entirely up to you and the genre you're writing. So there's not really like a right or wrong answer to that question, but I would say so long as you're keeping in mind like generally what goes into a, a, a normal like a piece of music that's not super experimental but incorporates you know general songwriting conventions then you're good to go you can use as many or as little instruments as you think fits the song and style you got anything else Oh yeah. Oh yeah, we do. <clears throat> yeah, so don't forget y'all that especially because of the situation right now, we're offering a lot more online classes. Um, call us if you need to negotiate the budget. Um, you know, just just reach out to um, reach out to us. You can find that on our website. The link was also posted in the comments. Um, you know, take, take this opportunity to, to do some more music stuff. Like if we're all going to be stuck in our homes anyway, we might as well, might as well get some work done. Right. Um, you can definitely hit me up on my SoundCloud with a direct message. Haven't gotten one of those in a while. Uh, or you can send me an email at Icarus at three, four, three labs.com. If you want to follow up with this, um, usually I get some follow up emails with people who didn't want to like ask longer form questions during the live stream. Um, keep in mind that I'm open for questions about things non-related to Ableton. You know, I'm I'm a career musician, which means that I've gone on multiple tours across America. I've worked with a lot of different vocal clients. I've worked with a lot of like corporate clients. I've done sync work. Like I'm I'm in and out of a lot of different aspects of the music industry, and I'm always you know more than willing to be forthcoming with the advice and what what I've learned along the way. So feel free to reach out to me there. You can also reach out to that email address about classes and I'd be happy to forward you um, onto the right people there. Um, so yeah. Um, oh, also if you want this project file, you gotta email me for it. <laughs> so I'd be happy to uh, zip this up and send it to you as well if you wanna kinda break it apart. Um, yeah, so with that said, thanks for joining. Thanks for tuning in. You know, thanks for all those donations. I'm just kidding, we're not streaming. Um, but yeah, thanks guys. Mm-mm. <clears throat>